And there we go. So hello and welcome to another Foreman Community Demo. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to some technical issues for earlier today, um, I have major, I had major networking issues with my uh, PC that I usually do all of my streaming on. And unfortunately, there was not enough time to recover from this. So we are not live. Um, I had hoped to return to live stream today. So if you're watching the recording at a later time and you have questions, please feel free to write to us on the foreman on LibreChat or um, post a question on our community discourse or under the YouTube video that this will be uploaded to. If anyone has joined us to here today and would like to ask a question directly, feel free to come off mute at any point um, in the, the talk. Uh, we, I suppose we all come here and demo with the hope that people will have feedback for us, will have questions for us. So don't be shy, it's, it's okay to ask questions. Um, and firstly, before I get started today, um, this is the final demo of 2021. We managed to maintain our three-week cadence throughout the entire year. Um, the last three haven't been live, um, but for that, I'm, I'm very grateful that they got to go ahead. So I'd like to just say thank you very, very much to Ori and Lucas, Lukash, who covered, uh, or LZAP, as he announced on the last demo. Um, I'm very, very glad that they were able to step in and to cover for me so that I could take some um, time off and also live stream PulpCon that we had a clash. So I was very happy that they went ahead, that everybody got the demo and that the community got to see the latest stuff. And um, so it's pretty cool. I appreciate the support and um, I know who to ask next time again. <laughs> so just before we begin, I've just a few announcements. And if you had a look at our newsletter for the last month as well, I just had mentioned that there are, you know, there are a few ways that you can contribute to the Foreman community without ever submitting code or submitting a pull request. And one of these ways are looking after or having uh, looking at evaluating our release candidates. And at the moment, um, we have a second release candidate is ready for testing for Foreman 3.1. And um, the Foreman 3.1 release is being prepared at the moment. So if you could install the release candidate, take a look through the workflows, take a look through the new features, whatever you're comfortable with, and just let us know how everything is looking, this would really contribute to the stability of that release. Um, all information about the about the release candidate, where you can find it, um, what you can expect in the release. That's all on our community discourse in a release announcement. And um, when when this goes on YouTube, I'll provide links to those details in our in our shall we say show notes. Um, as well as this, the first release candidate for Catello 4.3 is now available for testing. So in much the same way, if you can take a look at that and let us know what you think, you'll be contributing in in a great way to the stability of this next release. Um, I don't actually have the date handy. If anyone, does anyone here know the kind of scheduled expectation for GA of 4.3? Well, I have some Catello folks here. If not, it's okay. Um, I forget myself. I don't have the. Uh... Um, I think RC two was released, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh. RC two just went out um, yesterday or the day before. Did it? Okay, my apologies. So RC two is out. I thought it was yeah. um, RC one. Sorry, Chris. Um, yeah, I, I didn't make the announcement. Yeah, that's my fault. Oh, you didn't announce. <laughs> That's okay. I, I have I have a few um how would you say as my grandmother would say, I have a few um bones to pick with the communication on the Catello side this week, but um I'll leave that for after after the demo. Okay, so RC2 is available. So the second release candidate for 4.3 is out there. Take a look and let us know what you think about it. That would be a big help. And in other news, um, there was an announcement this week that um, some of the language, uh, the translations that are in different um, re repositories in the Foreman uh, on GitHub, some of them with a, a lower translation rate, I think the rate was below 40%, um, they are being just dropped completely. So just take a look and just make sure that doesn't impact you. But the you know, the this is not news, you know, the discussion of this went on for a little while before the PR was raised to remove these. So just take a look and, and make sure it doesn't affect anything that you are looking at. 
And in other news, Tomer posted earlier today that um, there were a lot of uh, deprecations that had been raised for a while that have now been removed from uh, Foreman Core. So you might, if you have some custom plugins and uh, you might need to check that everything is still working, there's more details on our forum. If you, if you are worried or concerned about anything like that, feel free to take a look there and let us know. And in other news, um, Andra, who will be talking to us later today in a different uh, unrelated uh, talk, he has been posting in the community about the way that as users and as Foreman developers, we interact with the Foreman taxonomy. So as part of this, we're just asking everyone, how do they use, uh, how do you use organizations and locations in your Foreman deployment? If you go to our community, there is some, a lot of people have already posted and given us some insights into, into their deployments, how they're laid out and how certain things affect them or don't, don't affect them whatsoever. And the more use cases we gather, the more we'll be able to understand um, what exactly you're doing. So if there's any changes, we can factor them in or perhaps look for solutions if there may be impact here and there. So please do come on to the community um, forum and just let us know how you are using that. And then as well as that, Eric Helms has been posting this week about um, future installations of Foreman. So at the moment, um, CentOS 8 is moving into end of life. You know, we've been talking about this, I suppose, in the wider open source community for the full year. But now we're kind of at the time where we're going to have to look at next steps for where you can install Foreman and how, you know, things are packaged, etc. So Eric has a post there um, with two different options laid out that he thinks and he's looking for your opinions on on what, how we can best move forward with this. So please do take a look at that because it's an important and it can help shape the direction of what's to come. And as well, uh, Evgeny has been posting in the last week or so about um, memory consumption in recent versions of Foreman. So all kind of issues around these have been explored. But as part of that, um, Evgeny is looking to create um, better tuning profiles that people can use to, you know, to, to tune and make sure that everything is working optimally. So optimally, is that how you say that word? Uh, so if so, he is asking um, for you to help us build out these meaningful profiles by providing us with your Foreman deployments, uh, memory, and CPU usage, uh, CPU usage, as well as other uh, information about your processes. So please do have a look for that post um, and contribute if you can. It just will help everyone in the long term. And I think the last thing from me today is that um, FormanCon took place, I think it's two weeks ago at this stage, seems like a lifetime ago, but we had presentations from all different parts of the community, from all aspects, many different plugins, many, many different um, angles. We had a use case uh, from a Foreman user. We had um, kind of some items about the, the web UI and, you know, uh, positive changes in simplified workflows to make things better for you, and also some form and developer focused uh, talks. So everything is available on YouTube in a, in the Foreman Con 2021 playlist. So if you missed something, have a browse through because there could be some interesting information about um, about different things you have to look forward to or different um, aspects of the project that might be of interest to you. So do do take a look, and I think. I think that's everything from me. Yeah, and I talked for a very long time. My apologies, uh, but I, I've been away for a while. So I'm glad to be back. And so that is everything from me and we shall begin our demos for the day. So our first demo is from Leosh and Leosh is going to talk to us about an Ansible role for the Convert to RHEL workflow. Yep, exactly. Excellent. So I am just share the screen. Okay, can you see my foreman? It's coming. Yeah, it's coming. Nice. It's there. So, yeah, nice. So hello, welcome everyone to the last demo of twenty one. Uh, 
I will have short presentation about new role, Ansible role, uh, convert to realm. Uh, this role is preparing all the data necessary for the migrations host from CentOS 7, 8, and Oracle for rel, uh, to rel. Uh, it basically, well, what it does is that it uploads the manifest, prepare the repositories required, and create products, host groups, and activation keys. So after running the playbook, uh, well, sorry, you should be able to convert hosts immediately and don't need to set up anything else. So yeah, let's see the details. So this is this is the role and the task that it contains. As I said, first thing is uploading the manifest and enabling the repositories. Then we will create the products and repos for the convert to rel tool, which is provided by Red Hat. Then we create activation keys required for the subscription manager when you subscribe the host. And of course, for the convenience, uh, we also set up some host groups so we can share the configuration data between the hosts. Um, let me show you the example playbook. How does it look? So this is the playbook. Uh, as you can see, you can specify the path to the manifest, the default organizations where you want to create your data. Uh, you can actually skip the step with uploading the subscription uh, data and enabling the repos because, of course, uh, a lot of users already have the manifest uploaded so and enabled their own repository, so this can be skipped. Uh, waiting for synchronization, yeah, when you enable new repos like for rel 8 or 7, that takes time, you know, to synchronize, so here in my case i'm just skipping the waiting for the synchronization and the other ones are for the content you know like if you don't want to for example uh create data and repos for the rel 7 you can just skip skip the path uh the same goes for the 8 version and for the oracle yeah i also would like to mention that for right now we support converting from centos 7 to rel 7 that goes in, the same goes for the version 8. And we also support uh, conversion of Oracle Linux from version 7 to uh, Oracle uh, to RHEL 7. And yeah, that's for the content. So let's see it in the action. Um, and simple playbook. And let's see, let's run it. And yeah, products have been created. Repository products basically goes everything that I show you in the task uh, file. Yeah, now there is waiting for the synchronization of the convert to rel repositories, which contains uh, repo data required for the convert to rel tool provided by Red Hat. Uh, we don't need to wait for it. I just wanted to show you that the playbook actually really works. And let's see the data in the format. So here are the products. You can see that. Uh, there is a product convert to seven, eight, and also for the Oracle. Uh, if I go to the detail, you can see that there is already for each product, there is an enabled repository with the packages required for the uh, conversion. Uh, what next? Yeah, activation keys, of course. When you will register the host, you can see that. <laughs> Oh yeah, activation keys for the CentOS and Oracle and also for the RHEL after you uh, migrate the hosts. And what else we were created? Yes, host groups. Uh, they are in configure host groups. If you want to, you can use host group so you can share the configuration data between the hosts. And yep, that's basically everything what the role is doing preparing the data for the conversion, so you don't have to set up anything manually. Mm, yeah, and that's everything from me for today. That's excellent, Leosh. Thank you very much. That looks um, that looks fun. That looks like a nice improvement. Um, myself and Maximilian were just discussing this workflow earlier in the week, so it's nice to see it automated. Has 
yeah, I just want to mention that I forgot to write documentation documentation for it, so it's not documented <laughs> anywhere. But I have it in my backlog, and I will promise that I will start working on it as soon as possible. But for now, it's it do, it's not documented now in new documentation page. But the the role has some readme file, so it, that there is some documentation. Uh, and Spalu self documenting anyway, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's perfect. Oh, yeah, no you are right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, has anyone any questions for Leosh? Uh, and that's okay if there isn't. I expect that um, since we are not live, there may be fewer fewer questions. So I won't wait too long. So Ron isn't with us yet. I'd say perhaps Ron will go at the end when he d does show up. So if you don't mind, Dominic, would you go next? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, so I will start with sharing my screen and and, and mm -hmm. I right now I have just uh, ordinary ordinary uh, form to creating a host because uh, Foreman has one nice feature called provisioning. It's provision a host so it sends certain attributes and so on and it's a very great feature. And one of the uh, one of the thing that provisioning makes is setting setting the root password for given hosts. Uh, that means that uh, in the under operating system tab, we have we can we can set there a root password for the new host. Uh, uh, before I made my picks. Uh, it works like uh, when uh, you can, uh, in general, you can set up this root password in, in three places, in settings, at her host group, and all the hosts. Uh, it should, uh, it's worked like uh, that uh, you, if you wrote the password to the settings or host group, it was derived to the host if the root password wasn't, uh, wasn't set there. And uh, and it was used for provisioning. So then you can use it to the log to the you you can use use this password to log in as root to that host. Uh, however, when you change the password, uh, the password for the hosts uh, and the host will uh, was reprovisioned. Uh, the password still still stays the same as the previous one. And it's a bit, it was a bad behavior. So I fix it. And right now, it works like uh, when you have a root password, uh, set it in the settings, and uh, you have a host group without set it password. The, the new hosts get the password uh, from the settings. Of course, if it's not set in this form. Uh, also, uh, if it's set it in the host group, it's derived to the host if there is not set it. And then if you are set it uh, there, it's just set it for the host. Uh, it could be a little confusing. So uh, when I set there one nice group called with pass, if, because I have really nice intelligent names for my host groups, and go back to the operating system, uh, there is little different uh, form, but there is saying that the password is currently set by host group. That means uh, that the set, uh, that the password is set from the host group. So I don't need to, I don't need to uh, to the set it there. Uh, and uh, if the password of the host group is changed, and the host is reprovisioned again the password will be the new password will be used uh, so it does it's mean that uh, if you are changed the password on the host group or in the settings uh, it's it's there is no task that will change it this root password in the currently provisioned hosts uh, there is another ways how to communicate with that you with the hosts like remote proxy and so, uh, remote execution so it's not necessary. And that's all from me. That's great, Dominic. Thank you very much. 
Has anyone any questions? Oh, you doke. Um, mm -hmm. That's fine. So I think it's probably your last demo for us, Dominic, I suspect. Um, actually, I have one question, Dominic. Um, I, w in what release, in what version of Foreman can people expect this? I think it's already in the develop branch. It's already merged, so I think it will be in the nearest release. Okay. Maybe. Okay, doc. Okay, doc. I'll keep a look for that. Um, thank you very much, Dominic. Um, so if we have no questions, we can move on to the we can move on to the next demos, the Catello demos, and then we can come back to run whenever he shows up. So up first is Jeremy, and Jeremy is going to talk to us about um, new host errata filtering by type and severity. That's right. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to do two little demos here. I'd like to show you a couple improvements to the new host details page that we've been making. Um, I'm going to show you errata and also repository sets. So uh, hopefully everyone can hear me and you can see my screen speak up if you can't. But uh, as you can see on the errata page here for my host, uh, I've got 92 errata here of different types. And uh, what we've added this time is some drop downs so that you can filter the list by type and severity. So um, if I want to see just security errata, I can do that and it will show me only the security type. And if I want to see only the moderate ones, I can also do that. And now it's showing me just moderate and just security. If I want to go back to the unfiltered list, I simply click to unselect the filters that I just selected. Uh, so that is errata type and severity. I also want to mention that unfortunately Partha is unable to demo today, but uh, that that actually completes all of the errata functionality on the new host details page. So we've got, uh, I think what he added was select all most recently, and then all the remote execution actions are in place. So um, I am delighted to announce that uh, errata is complete. Moving on to, um, oh, by the way, we also have a, a basic table available for packages. And I think Lucy's going to demo that on the next demo. Uh, so next we have repository sets. This is a new tab that we've just added. And the uh, purpose of this screen is you can see the repositories that are available to this host and you can enable or disable them. And uh, so each one has a default state. Uh, and you can see in the status here, it's either enabled or disabled. And you can override that default state by using these action menus on each table row. You can override to disabled, override to enabled, or reset to default. And uh, it's not a task, so the action's immediate. It just does it and updates the table. And you can see the, uh, the little flag here indicates that it's been overridden. Uh, so back on the overview tab for this host, uh, you can see that this host is in the default uh, content view and the library environment. Now, for a host in a non-default view or the and not in the lifecycle environment, the repository sets tab behaves a little bit differently. So I just want to show you that real quick. Uh, so what it's going to do is it will default to showing you only the repositories that are relevant for this host. So uh, we only see two repositories here. And you have a toggle group here. You can, uh, you can show all, and it will still show you all of them if that's what you want to see. Uh, this replaces some uh, checkboxes that we had. Here's the, the previous repository sets page, and it's this checkbox here is replaced by this shiny new toggle group. Um, and just to be clear, there's no change in which repositories are shown on the page. It's just uh, trying to explain it a little bit better. And so the, the view and the toggle group, um, it takes into account uh, which which you've selected here, and also whether simple content access is enabled or not. 
and it takes those two pieces of information and uh, it composes them into a message here on, on the banner and uh, tries to be a helpful message showing you what you're actually looking at. So uh, that's repository sets. Those are the two things I wanted to show you today and uh, I'm available for any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, congratulations on the completion of Ear of Irata. Um, that is excellent. Um, so we have, if we don't have any questions, we have run now, but um, so I have one question, sorry for interrupting. No, that's that's great news. That's, that's even better than me talking. So please go ahead. Um, so regarding the Irata classification, um, maybe you can share uh, once more, if possible. So yeah. to my understanding, uh, there are other uh, operating systems, for example, SLES, that classify errata in four categories in contrast to RHEL, which I think does security bug fix and enhancement. Um, is that somewhat baked into that, uh, into that type filter? Um, I'm actually not sure how errata from uh, from other operating systems work. Um, I I do know there's there's not really a change in functionality from from the old page, uh, but yeah, I'm just I'm just getting at it from the the type field. I think it would require some code changes if you wanted to include any more types because these types are uh, pretty much hard coded and also the severities. Okay. And uh, once more, please, um, which version of uh, Foreman and Catello is this? Or will this be in? Uh, this will be in Catello 4.3. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Maximilian, for your question. Um, okay, Doc. So we have... We have Ronna, who was late, um, was just late joining. Ron, do you want to go now, or would you like to wait until the end? Yeah, I can go. And uh, thank you for uh, waiting. No I get stuck a bit with the kids. Happens. Uh, a bit later in uh, Israel. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's the problem. So let me share my screen. Uh, it's also about the uh, extension in the host page. So we kind of relate to to the previous uh, demo. Uh, so uh, before that, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ron Lavi. Uh, I work at uh, Red Hat, software engineer. And I also work on the insights integration of, uh, of Red Hat into satellite. Uh, so basically, we just added uh, another feature here. It's the total risk. When you have a host and it's uh, fully synced with uh, the Red Hat Cloud, you can get recommendation, recommendations to fix for that host. And basically, we just added this uh, chart. And now, a question for you, because it's a very early feature. Um, does it look clickable? I mean, the point of this graph is not only to show the, the graph, but it's also interactive. So later you can tell me if it, if it if it looks okay or not. We can uh, change it. So basically, there are the links here uh, that if you click on them, you go to the insights tab. Uh, in a in a moment, we will click on it. And also on the chart itself, you can click and you see the uh, and the color changing. And we added this uh, pointer uh, cursor. Uh, hopefully, it, it's good enough but we want to let people know that it's actually uh, clickable. So when you click uh, on one of the items, you can click on the graph or on the links to the site. Uh, it redirects you to the insights tab on the same page with total risk of low. And yeah, basically you can you have a um, search like in other pages in Foreman or uh, yeah, you can search for the type of the risk. And as Jeremy showed just before, we are also planning to add some drop down for a shorter searching uh, by type, like total risk or uh, remediation. Um, yeah, so basically you can go back to the overview 
click on what's mo mostly interesting for you. And yeah, let's say after you decided that uh, you found the recommendations that you want to fix, uh, let's select here uh, some. You can select a few or select from uh, all pages. Uh, then you can click remediate and just fix the issues uh, you want. Um, some of them have multiple resolution. Some of them requ require a reboot. And from here, after you click here, remediate, you will go to the remote execution page. Let me show it just uh, another time. And yeah, and then you can trigger all the fixes for a specific host. You can see here the uh, heat ID is the recommendation ID and the resolution is the fix. Uh, then you submit and all of your hosts are uh, totally fixed. Uh, yeah, so back to the host page. Uh, yeah, and here there's also a link to view all accommodation. That's the accommodation for the specific host. Uh, I, I didn't rebase, but we have also, I'll show it uh, next time. We have also links here if you want to read more uh, about specific recommendation. So you have links to the Reddit cloud. Uh, you can read more about it and see if, if it fits you and you want, really want to uh, do the remediation. And you can also go to Foreman uh, Insights page. Uh, it uses, basically the table is the same table in uh, both pages, just without for a specific host. And yeah, that's it. Are there any questions? There'll probably be questions later. I suppose question to the community. Does it does it look clickable? Thank you very much, Ron. I was glad that you managed to to make it. Um and I know the time zone isn't ideal for you either. So thank you very much. And thank with, you. With great. So we had a we had a few people drop off for different reasons. So in our lineup, we have Partha, but I th we will move on to Justin, if that's OK. So Justin has two talks. Uh, the first one is to do with restricting a custom repository to RHEL 9. And then he is going to start with uh, uh, talks that then James will continue with regards to the increasing levels of um, OS tree content support that we have to look forward to in future Catello releases. So thank you very much, Justin. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, so right here, I've got a RHEL 9 beta uh, client installed and it's registered to a Foreman instance, a Catello instance. Uh, we can see now that there is a New restriction. Wrong, wrong option. Uh, when we are looking at a repository, we can now uh, restrict to rel nine or rel eight. And so what I've got here is I've got an Apple product, and I've got Apple eight restricted to rel uh, eight, and a uh, Apple nine restricted to rel nine. Apple nine doesn't exist yet. This is kind of just an example, and these are both in the same product. And on my client, you can see that oops. you can see it's subscribed to this product. Um, and I can do a yum repo list and see that uh, I'm getting my rel nine Apple, but not my rel eight. If I change this to um, rel eight. But yeah, we the list again. Let's see, my Apple 9 has disappeared. So this setting is allowing you to restrict custom repos um, if you're using Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And that's really the end of this demo. I'll move on to OS tree um, smart proxy syncing. 
we see here we've got a content view version that's already been published. You'll see, I think, in a few minutes, Ian publishing one of these. Um, and we've got an OS tree repository added to uh, the content view. And then I've also got a smart proxy that is assigned to the uh, production environment. Let me go over to click edit. It's assigned to production. Um, so I will go back to my content view and actually promote this to production. And while that's happening, um, if you didn't know, you could browse slash pulp slash content on a smart proxy or a Catello server. Uh, and you see here this, that my new content view called OS3 One has now popped up on the smart proxy, uh, which here is called Capsule Dev. So it's actually been synced down to the smart proxy. And if we go to the smart proxy tab and go over to content, you'll actually see now that that content view is showing up um, and the one repository that's in it is showing up as having been synced to the smart proxy. And those are the two things I wanted to demo. Um, thanks for watching. Thank you, Justin. Has anyone any questions or comments? Okay, talk. Um, in that case, we will continue with more um, Catello OS3 content demos. Um, James is going to talk to us about um, OS3 content uploads via the Hammer CLI. And um, yeah, then we'll have another one from Ian after that. All right, Melanie, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name's James Jeffers. I'm a member of the Catello team, and we've been working on OS3 support for a while now, I'm trying to get into Catello 4.3. Uh, so what I'm going to show you is a real quick example, um, just like just, uh, Justin had just demonstrated uh, uh, some of the manipulation with OS3 content. I'm going to show you uploading OS3 refs. Uh, so I've already prepared a OS3 repository, as you can see here, ID7. And we've prepared a rather small archive of a pulp fixture. And the reason we're going to use a small one is because typical uh, OS tree image sizes can be rather large. So rather than make everybody wait, we have a pretty small one. So the Hammer repository upload content, we've added support for OS tree ref types. We've also added a uh, parameter for specifying the OS3 repository name, which is important when uploading OS3 content types. So we'll go ahead and we'll start that. And uh, in the background, of course, this is getting added to that repository. And of course, Hammer is going to report that it's successfully uploaded uh, that archive. So I'm going to switch now to my Catello uh, here. Let's see. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm just seeing a blank screen. Is that coming up for anybody? Now you're in business. Okay. Sorry about that. No, it's All the right, demo. So this, it's... I'm going to refresh this. Um, let me see the content types increment. And there they are. Uh, on this version, I don't have the uh, generic OS3 uh, content type displays enabled. But if you go ahead and investigate, the uh, uploaded OS3 refs, you'll see the names. And these versions are actually the hash sums of each OS3 commit. Uh, so you'll get those displayed. So that is a real quick example. Like I said, the, the normal size OS3 images are you know, gigabytes in size. So for the demo, we just wanted to, so that we could get done in a few minutes. Um, and I think you'll see with uh, future uh, demonstrations for OS3, of course, uh, syncing them to external capsules, um, as well as uh, content view publications like you've seen. So, all right, that pretty much concludes the demonstration for that. That is great, James. Thank you very much. Uh, has anyone any questions? 
Okay, doc. So then we'll move on to the OS3 content view publishing then with Ian. All right, thanks. Um, just going to share my screen. All right. So, hey everyone, um, I am Ian and I'm also the Tello dev, in case you didn't know. Um, and I'm going to be sharing another bit of um, OS tree stuff that we've been developing. So, this time it's with content views. Um, so, we're able to uh, publish OS tree content in content views now. Um, so, I have a content view here called the OS tree test content view. Um, if we go over to our repositories tab, you can see, so I have a uh, young repo I could add, but then there is the OS tree repo that I have synced. There's two OS tree reps. So I'm going to just go ahead and add this to the content view. And now I already did this once but I'll publish another version. And then after this is all published, I'll just quickly show what Pulp is showing in the back end for this. Firstly, so you see we have our version 2.0, and you can see there are two OSG refs. We can take a look inside the version. You can see the repositories that are here. You see the OS tree repo. You see the OS tree refs here. And then you can even go in here if you want and uh, get a closer look at the um, at the OS tree refs. You can see the name and their version. So now that I've shown you that in the UI, I'll just show you a quick taste of what um, pulp is showing for the related repository. Um, I'll just do this in the background and then show you a paste in the um, in my browser here because it is a bit annoying to switch to my terminal. So if we go back to the versions, I'm seeing in the database this is version three. So you guys can't see this, but I'll just quickly query it so I can. Um, so I can grab the uh, version href in pulp so I can query it. And then I'm just going to query this in my terminal. And OK, I'll paste it so you can see. So just switching over here. Um, we can see that uh, there's a new repository version. It is a version one. And in the JSON, um, you can see OS tree content was added. It says there's two OS tree commits, an OS tree config, OS tree object. But what's most important to folks will be the OS tree reps. And you can see two were added. So that's pretty much it. Content View Publishing is working for OS Tree. And let me know if you have any questions. That's great, Ian. It's, um, I know a lot of people were sad when um, there was no OS Tree content support when we moved first from Pulp 2 to Pulp 3. So it's great to see that this is coming along nicely now. So that is excellent. If Does anyone have any questions related to OS Tree content before we Go on. Okay, doc. So that um, that concludes the foreman user focus demos of today, and we have one developer focus demo from Andra, who is going to give us an update on Rails six point one and plugin maintenance around that. So, are you with us still, Andra? Yeah, I see you. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. And I know I said that I will not share a screen, but Melanie was 
kind of frowning at me, so I will have some background for you to look at something. <laughs> so, uh, first of heads up that we are now uh, in the process of upgrading uh, our Rails from 6.0 to 6.1, uh, which mainly is uh, about enabling Zeitwerk autoloader, which basically means uh, you will in ideal case, you will notice nothing. And in uh, as a downside, we will occasionally break uh, all plugins. Uh, so, uh, but this is actually really necessary to go, uh, go going forward. And it improves the logical, logical process of uh, initializing uh, RELS and our application. Um, hopefully we can get some performance uh, tweaks in and actually the code reloading should work more reliably uh, after the after the fact after we enable uh, site work uh, until that time uh, I must warn all the developers that breakages in the uh, boot of rails are possible we will try to avoid them, but uh, obviously we, we are not testing it with all the plugins, even though we try. So um, Nightlist might go right and Evgeny will scream at me, but sometimes even Nightlist won't pick up the failures. Uh, so be aware of that. And if you uh, encounter any issues, please try to update this post or ping me uh, on IRC or wherever you can, that this is uh, not working and it broke your plugin. I will try to list the breaking changes in this post and I made it a wiki so anyone can update it with what they encountered. Um, and uh, I will share a PR of the breaking change where you will share. Uh, all the related PRs, probably from there, it would be easy to figure out how to fix your breakage. So if it's already known, it will be here, but if it's not, please ping me. Um, if you would like to help, I've shared the Redmine tracker, uh, but if you are testing it, it's uh, quite a huge help as well. Uh, so that's the Rails upgrade, but uh, there was one breakage that uh, basically got uh, Lukash Zapleta quite uh, angry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, we didn't announce that breaking change because I didn't realize and Tomer, who was uh, fast to review and it seemed uh, like quite um, meaningless change so we thought nothing will break and it broke everything so <laughs> as it usually goes so sorry for that Lukash but uh, he was <laughs> yeah thank you but yeah uh, he raised the concern that uh, after branching the uh, the plugins uh, are kind of in um, bad uh, bad phase that uh, they are trying to fix their their breakages that they introduced, and if we break break core, it's getting harder for them to figure out if uh, the CI is failing because of some change in plugins uh, or if, uh, if the core just just broke something uh, for them. So that's kind of agonizing in the release process for sure. Uh, though I would really not like to take uh, some time after branching to keep keep the changes out because we have we already have some stabilization period and the release cycle is not that uh, that huge and getting the changes uh, changes early uh, in is allowing us to have as much time to test them as possible and more eyes 
and more developers touching the breaking changes. So that's why we started basically immediately after after the uh, branching. Um, though this got me thinking, and uh, I've drawn this graph just uh, just before this meeting, but uh, this is just a proposal, and I will talk to some packaging folks and try to hammer out something uh, more clear. But this is basically an idea that we would get some uh, code uh, that is that is tested against uh, the stable version that is just branched out. And what I would imagine is uh, to branch the plugin uh, and release the RC uh, of the plugin. And that would get tested in the CI against against the latest, latest stable stable branch. Uh, and once everything is ready, uh, we would actually release. But uh, till that point, uh, the CI would be taking the uh, tagged version or uh, or version from the branch, and we might we will have to figure out this uh, this box here how to do that actually, uh, where to take the code from, if that would be RubyGems or uh, actually directly from the uh, from the repository. And only after uh, everything is uh, ready in the plugin, uh, we would release the uh, release the full version on RubyGems. Uh, this has some ifs and buts, though uh, I believe that we should follow the uh, core branching and core core versions with, in the plugins uh, a little bit more closely. So yeah, I will share this process after it's a little bit more fine-tuned on the discourse. And let's take the discussion from there. Yeah. LZAP has raised his hand. <laughs> yeah, I was not angry. Now I'm now I'm angry. Yeah. Now I'm just kidding. Uh so yeah, uh, well, it's a nice proposal. However, plugin authors are like they don't usually have a rigid rigid uh, you know, or release pro uh, release process. I definitely not me. Like it's a, it's a clusterfuck when I'm do, doing releases. I'm just, you know, you know, trying to follow what I did last week. But, but anyway, you know, RC we do have like uh, we we do have like a checklist for core and it's uh, like done and dri driven by competent people. While I'm not saying plugin authors are not competent not at all, I know I'm just incompetent, but but that is not. But you know we plugins do not necessarily follow the uh, versioning scheme. Like you have a plugin that is okay to not to be released for several foreign versions as long as it works. So I'm not sure if this. This is, you know, okay. What I was trying to say in the original blog post was, oh, sorry, in the original uh, post was that, you know, the way I do my plugins is I wait until RC1 is out, which is a little bit, be, you know, after we branch, of, of course, sometimes a few days, sometimes a week, depends on uh, if we run into problems. And then I just do a build of my plugin and because I need to have something installed so I can test the plugin if it actually works. That's what I learned uh, in the past that you know releasing untested work is not a good way to go. So, so, so what I do is I test with RC one and then now I'll do the release. And if if I have time and I, I do this the first day when RC one is out, that's that's the best scenario, right? But what you're proposing is even going into further, like start breaking things in core even before RC one. That's what I don't like, and you know so. What I would like to maybe see is just maybe wait for RC2 or at least a few days after RC1, something like that. Like give plugin authors some time to breathe, they will eventually adapt. That's my view. But if you think, uh, guys, that we need to have some kind of a more strict um, gui guidelines for plugins, of course, we can write guidelines, but the question is who will follow them, right? Because we have so many 
plugin authors from all over the world. So it can be a challenge to enforce this right. Well, what I was trying to propose is uh, that you would have a version of uh, code in your plugin that uh, you are um, stabilizing, stabili stabilizing against the newest stable version. Uh, so basically, you, you would branch uh, after the core branches, and then you would not care about any change in the develop, uh, develop branch of uh, the core. Uh, before I can branch any of my plugins, I need to make sure that it works right with the release of Foreman. But what, what commit, uh, of course, should I test with, right? That's the question because there, there's no more, no, no point. Like we could do this after branching. Yes, that's, that's possible. Yeah, that's what I'm saying after branching the core branch the plugin and that branch would be tested and any new changes would be cherry picked that's the downside of the of it obviously that you would have to start cherry picking in your own plugin and that's a little bit more work but if it's your plugin you can push directly into branches and then it's a little bit easier yeah sure go ahead publish your proposal we'll see what others think so um I'm uh, eager to see uh, other opinions as well. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for raising the initial uh, initial problem you are facing. That's great, guys. Thank you very much. So we have just kind of come to the end of our demos today. And so I would just like to thank everybody who came along and demoed. Uh, today and also every three weeks over the last year. I'd like to thank all of you also who come along and ask questions or follow up with questions afterwards. Um, we will resume probably in mid January 2022. So we, so the, the usual cast of demo folks, you have a bit of a break from me chasing you around the place looking for um, content and um, so enjoy enjoy your break. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions, any comments about anything you've seen here or anywhere else, just feel free to write to us on our community discourse. I will upload this video soon and include all of the relevant links, etc. And anything else, just feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, thank you all so much for your time today, and we will talk again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.